Praise God. Good morning. I don't know about you, but hey, it's one of those days where you're just undone. Amen. Fantastic presence of God here this morning. Let's just stand. Remain. Remain in this atmosphere. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Lord, I thank you for moments like these. Moments of acquaintance. Of fellowship. Of interaction. Of love. With you, God. And we make room as Sandra put so well. We make room in our heart, in our mind, in our soul. May we be your habitation. Come, Holy Spirit. And God, as we look at the scriptures, as we look at your word and your, your voice, I pray we would continue to humble ourselves and receive and be changed and leave this place equipped to bless others, to share what we have, to be sowers, to be communicators of your love and your gospel. And we humble ourselves with obedience to your gospel and to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. Last week, as as, um, was shared, we began in LAW looking at spiritual warfare and We looked at it last week. I was um, emphasizing to you not to get carried away with the title because we can talk about tearing down strongholds, taking nations when we can't even take our own lives, right? We can't get mastery or victory in our homes. And that's what we began last week looking at, victory within the family, victory within the home, and the great importance of that. If I can continue this week along the same theme, of what I want to call this civil war. The war that takes place within ourselves. You know when a country goes to war, that's called war. But when a country has a fight within itself, that's a civil war. It's internal. And the reality of the Christian life is we have both. We have war with this world, but we also have a very severe war going on inside. I'm afraid until we leave this earth, that is going to be the case. If you look on YouTube, you'll find a thousand videos called The Habits of the Wealthy. And I want to do a play on words there with The Habits of the Healthy, right? And look at how spiritually healthy am I? Where am I at with this? You know, the the, the one person you cannot get away from is, it's you. If you take a shower, guess who's there? Yeah. If you go to work, you. You. If you come home, you. Even if you go on holiday, sorry, you're going as well. You cannot escape yourself. You're always there. And so more attention really needs to be paid internally, looking at who I am and how holistically healthy I am. So I did some research this week, extensive research, just at areas of health, holistic health. And I was quite shocked. I found 26 truths that those who study this field find that we need to focus on if we're ever going to proceed in life. The first one, interesting, (laughs) particularly for me, from my background as a Catholic, healthy people forgive themselves for their mistakes. When they get something wrong, when they blow it, they understand that and they're quick to move on. I don't think there will be an exception in this room. I think every single one of us are probably ashamed and embarrassed about some things we've done, right? I think there's something that you can think of right now, and even to this day, you say in your heart, yeah, that was me. (laughs) I did do it. I did. I did. It was me. And it's an embarrassment. It's a shame. But it happened. And learning to get over that, learning to get past that, is one of the elements 
of being a healthy person. Because it's true, some people get stuck, don't they? Something happens. I had a member, when I took over a church, I was told about this guy, and he made an appointment to see me. And I was told, you need to know something about this guy. He was driving down the street one day, and he came to a blind summit. You know, that's when you can't see over a little hill. He drove over the hill, and there was a nine-year-old child. He killed her. Car went straight over her. And I was due to meet this guy, and I was concerned, of course, for him. How would you live with that? How would you cope with that, you know? So I got to the meeting expecting to have to counsel him, and I was shocked. I mean, he was one well-balanced man. Seriously. He knew God. He knew what had happened. He classified it as an accident. He had gone through all the dynamics And he was free in the right sense. He said, every day I think about this, but it's not going to hold me down. It's not going to depress me. And hey, it could, couldn't it? So good example. But I've met too many the other way. Right? Uh, In our church in Dublin, we twinned up with Teen Challenge, which is a drug rehab outfit that's all over the world. And I know many of the leaders in that group, they concentrate on getting people off heroin. One of the golden rules in TC, as we call it, Teen Challenge, is you're not allowed to smoke. From the day you arrive, that's the rule. Everybody has to stick by the rule because that's what actually makes them different from other rehabs and that's what makes them effective. So I know them all in UK and Europe. I meet them all the time and they've preached for me many times. One day, I'm walking down the high street of a city And I'm walking past a restaurant. I look through the window and guess who I see? One of the directors. And guess what he's doing? (laughs) Smoking. Yeah. So I thought, oh, oh, okay. Problem. So what do you do? What do you do in that situation? God doesn't have to show me to him physically. I could see him in the spirit, right? But I saw him physically. He was there. So I decided to say nothing and do nothing. I I didn't think he saw me. So I just kept on walking and I say, saw that, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to cover you, right? I'm not going to pretend I didn't see it. I saw it and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask God to lead you and guide you and bless you. So a few days go by and I get a phone call from him. Can I meet? I thought, oh, he saw me, saw him, right? I thought he didn't see me. He saw me. So he said, can I meet you? Yes, no problem. Well, he came into our church like a whip dog. <laughs> you know, head hanging. You saw me, didn't you? I said, yes, yes, I saw you. And he started to say, I feel awful. I feel rotten. I feel terrible. I mean, what's wrong with me? How can I live like this? How can I be such a hypocrite? And he went on and I needed to get him out of his, get the stuff out of his system, you know. And when he finished beating himself up, You know, you finished? (laughs) Can I speak now? Do you know what? You have preached for me on more than one occasion. And we filled that place with people who had problems. And at the end of every meeting, you loved them. You were compassionate to them. You forgave them. You restored them. Now, where is all that stuff for yourself? How come... You're so full of mercy and so full of grace for every human being except you. That is not going to work. It's not healthy. Agreed? It's not healthy. You need to accept who you are and that's going to make you better. Not worse. So I I, I explained to you and explained to him. I'm not talking about taking things for granted or being abusive. I'm talking about being able to walk in the grace of God. Amen. Amen. For yourself. We're great at, you know, miracles for other people, aren't we? Great at believing, oh yeah, you can do that. But then when it comes to us, so often we shrink back. The Bible's example of this is the Apostle Peter. Crying in a doorway, remember? When he knew his destiny, he knew where he was supposed to go, he knew the person he was supposed to be, but I'm not all that. Not only that, 
you deny the very Christ who you profess to follow when he's just about to be murdered at the moment that he needed you, at the moment that you would have been precious, at that moment. I don't know him. Who? At that moment. Hard to live with that. Yet, I guarantee you that Peter got over it. Right? You know he got over it because he grew. People who don't forgive themselves can't grow. And Peter got past that moment. He accepted personal responsibility for his weakness, for his failure. And he didn't hang on to it. Do you know what? There are people on this planet whose sole existence is to make you feel guilty. Right? They're dreaming up ways of, of, of talking to you, of, of accusing you. Right? That's life. They're in your family. They're in your workplace. And you need to be careful of that and don't let them do that. Don't let people affect you that way. Rise above it. Live above it. I know the God I serve. I know Him. And I will not be held down, tied down. Unforgiveness of oneself. Point number one. Healthy Christians, healthy people have learned to forgive themselves. Point number two. Healthy people don't hold grudges, right? Amen. Walking in forgiveness. I put in brackets there. It's a good statement. Some people would rather get even than get ahead. I'm sorry, guys. You can't get out of bed without somebody doing you something wrong, right? Every day people do stuff wrong. But I've got to get into my thick head. I have a choice, Michael. You've got a choice. You can get even, but you're not going to... Get ahead. You're going to get stuck. God can't work with a nasty, vindictive spirit like that. It's not good. So I make a choice not to get even. Now, I've shared with you before, I come from a family of nine kids. That's a big family. Lots of noise. And my mother, many times, many times in my life, my mom said the same refrain about me. The one thing about Mike, he never holds grudges. I heard that as I grew up, and it was true until I got saved. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? It's not a strange thing. Quirky little thing. Now, not that I have a problem with it, but the first problem I encountered with it was at salvation. Because it became spiritual. You with me? It became a spiritual issue. What was a natural good trait, once I entered the kingdom, became a contest Right Between me and darkness, are you going to continue that same trait? And I have, but it took a bit of work. I had to face off some serious issues with an issue with, with a person who hurt me more than any other person has ever hurt me. Okay? Someone really did me some, some serious damage. And I was able to get through that. Praise the Lord. Or I wouldn't be here. I was able to get through that through counseling. I couldn't find anybody to help me. I had to get my help from God directly, straight, person to person, me to God. I had to seek it until I found it. I was determined to be free from that grudge, from that unforgiveness that I knew was in my heart. And even, it's just, I could not get that out of my system. Right? Couldn't get it out of my system. But by God's grace, I did get it out of my system. There's always a way. He will provide you with that way out. And God showed me because I relentlessly sought him. I want that freedom from this. I'm not going to carry bitterness. So healthy Christians forgive themselves. But more than that, they don't hold on to grudges. And hey guys, we did a series recently on fulfilling your dream. Remember? Reaching for your dream. Well, I hope you've got a big dream. But you, God can't put a big dream in a small person. Right? God can't put a, a big dream in a small mind or a narrow-minded person. If I'm going to fulfill a big dream, I need to be a big person. Amen. Amen. And that means letting go quickly and easily of the offenses that do come. Scripture says that. It is impossible, but that if un- offenses do come. So they are going to come. It's one of those regrettable promises. Number three, healthy people know how to give 
and receive healthy criticism, self-critique, both to yourself and to others. And this is something I have changed in over the years. You probably won't believe this, but I was a very shy person, right? Very shy, very timid, yeah? Very timid, very shy, and retiring. And I worked in a hospital for 10 years. I lived in a home for nurses for that time. And I had a friend there called Mick. And we used to go clubbing. Yes, that's right, I used to go clubbing. We used to go clubbing and all that kind of jazz, right? And I remember, he was my mate until he got a ghetto blaster because he lived in the room next door. And we started coming back at night and when he would get in, I need to go to sleep. And he would turn on that thing, boom, 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 boom. Two o'clock, three o'clock, four. Oh. So I'd have to get up and go downstairs, sleep in the day room. And he did this again and again and again. Now he's my mate. Do you know what I did? Nothing. I didn't criticize him. It was a, it was a moment where I was so weak in myself. Do you know what I did? I distanced myself from him. I was no longer his friend. I removed myself out of his life instead of saying, Mick, <laughs> you know that ghetto blaster. Can we put a hammer to it? <laughs> it, instead of dealing with the issue, you know, with maturity, I changed the way I treated him. So when I was around him, I was cold to him. I withdrew myself from his circles, from his friends. And that's the only thing I could do at that time. Very childish, huh? Yeah. Terrible. And what happened was I actually moved rooms. I moved downstairs and then I became his friend again. Right? <laughs> now, but that's what we do when I have not developed within myself the ability to care front, not confront, but care front people to say, look, what you're doing is not good. I can't walk with this. This is not good. And, uh, you know, one thing that happened to me within my marriage was learning to let the dust settle, right? When you have an argument or something's hot, don't deal with it till it settles down. And now to this day, I will always wait until I know my spirit is right. I'm going to a person to bring, uh, you know, a correction of some sort, but I won't do it until I think their spirit is right and my spirit is right. Now we can get somewhere. But if I jump in too early, that's just going to turn into an argument. So by all means, you know, be open to receive. Every person in this room needs advice. You don't know everything. You can't see everything. You're not made that way. That's not the way this works. Every single person needs outside help. And healthy people know that. Unhealthy people, you can't help them. Many people like that. You just can't help them. You try to give advice and they won't take it. Got nowhere to put it. They see it as negative. So I need to develop within myself the ability to confront people, care front people amiably, nicely, and still be able to keep my relationship. But also I need to be sensitive myself that I need outside help. Number four, healthy people love themselves. And this is a huge issue in the kingdom because it's an issue that has huge confusion attached to it. What does it mean? to love myself. But there are many Christians, especially with my background, who struggle with this. This church is good. You guys are great. But how do I let people treat me? If I let people treat me like trash, you've lost your own dignity. You've lost your self-respect. Amen? 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 You don't let anybody yes, treat you like trash. Nobody. Nobody but nobody, but nobody, nobody. Everybody say nobody. <laughs> nobody. Nobody. It's important. Nobody can treat you like that. You keep your own value and have a sense of your worth. And don't let life or the world tamper with that. Don't do it. Don't do it. It will affect you, you know, really badly, maybe in ways that you don't even realize. 
But you can see people, you can tell how much value people have of themselves just I mean, by look at your body. Do you look after your body? Is it junk food? Yes. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I meant, uh, <laughs> junk food. I, I, you guys didn't know me, but four years ago, I was 17 and a half stone. Um, that's a head, very heavy. I was twice the man I am now. I, I was very big, very big. And in fact, the last time I weighed myself, you would have been there. I, um, I remember the 17 and a half mark, and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the scales. I thought they're broken. It doesn't work. Stupid things. I couldn't believe it. And I stopped going back to the scales because it's just too depressing. How, did, how on earth did that happen? And I had lost a grip on the value of my physical health. I just lost it for a moment, right? And I realized this has consequences. I'm going to have to deal with this. And it's taken me four years to get a grip on that. Four years. Some days you win, some days you lose. But I've got a very serious attitude to that because that has a detrimental effect on my value. And I will not let my mind overrule me. I've got a spirit in here. I'm born again and I'm not going to eat that junk. I will discipline myself. Amen. Amen. Civil war. I will discipline myself and I will win that war. You can see it in the way people dress. You can see it in whether or not they go for education. I think it was Pastor Joe on camp. He made a statement and maybe some of you didn't get it. He, 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 it's an important statement. He said we can't come to church every Sunday and just get motivation, motivation, motivation. He's right. And for some Christians it's coming to the church, stand on the seat, shout and go home. We need education. Okay? If you take an idiot and you motivate him, you've got a motivated idiot. <laughs> Not much good. You need the education to underpin every single thing. But, hey guys, who turned up this morning at 10 o'clock? Don't put your hand up. How, I mean, there you are. You've got a free class offered. Who turned up? You've got to take it seriously. And not just what we do here. But outside, I constantly try to advance myself. Constantly. Endlessly. Seeking new things to learn. Uncovering new things. Trying to develop myself, particularly my mind. Because that's the driving force. Working and working and working on these things. Healthy people love themselves. Right, Richard? Sorry. <laughs> Richard is a very unusual person, I think. Right? <laughs> Shall I stop there? Am I going to be in trouble? <laughs> Richard loves himself. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you something. Of everybody in this place, and you guys are strong. This is a great church. Do you know who I think? Just my opinion. You don't have to agree. Do you know who, of all of us, including me, has got the best grip on this? Richard. Hem. And do you know why they, well, he can be a bit weird sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's because he knows exactly who he is. And if you don't believe me, ask Georgina, she'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> he knows exactly who he is. He will not be put down by you. True? Yeah. Oh, no. He will not be put down by you. He'll not be belittled by you. And my point is, folks, even in a church... It's weird. Even in a church, because without knowing it, we actually do devalue ourselves. Without knowing it, sneakily, we permit things that should not be permitted. And he's been free of that, and that's a fantastic thing. Amen. 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 Shall I move on, Richard? Okay, yes. Amen. <laughs> Love themselves. Point five, very important point. Healthy people know how to take a risk sorry before I move on from that point just one other point about loving yourself you're going to have to take it seriously the, one of the biggest companies in the world is Herbal Life you've probably heard of them massive company and you know how they got there they became that big with a simple little t-shirt and the t-shirt had this 
written on it. It said, lose weight now, ask me how. So these guys go out in the street with the t-shirt and people read the t-shirt and what's the question that people ask? How? Tell me how. And they, listen carefully, biggest, one of the biggest companies in the world. When the people ask you how, you always reply with the same answer. Are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious about this? Because life is serious. Are you serious? Are you just one of those people who want to talk about it but not actually do anything? Are you serious? And that's how they became a huge company because they found those who were serious. And in, t- in terms of the kingdom, it's the same thing, folks. Are you serious? Or is it all about jumping up and down on the seat? Right. Are you serious? Are you actually going to commit to something? Some of you, you want an above average job. You want above average pay. But you want to be an average person. And that ain't going to work. Correct? And the only way that your life is going to change is if you change. The only way things are going to get better is if you get better. Otherwise, they're going to stay the same. And there's a seriousness there. I like my disciplines. I do my disciplines. I like my disciplines. You know, I like them because they help me. They're my friend. And I've learned just simple disciplines in my life. If I take on one extra discipline, it affects everything. Every discipline you do affects all the others. So when I go for a run, for example, that affects my mind. And then when I go to the supermarket, I don't buy junk because it changed my mind. It's true. Every discipline affects every other discipline. So when I add these little, you know, good things to my life, if I add two disciplines, I get like 10 benefits. So don't be slow, don't be lazy, don't be idle, but employ these things. Analyze yourself. Am I healthy? Am I healthy or not? That was number four. Healthy people love themselves. Number five, healthy people know when to take a risk. And this is critical, folks. For me, I, this, I, I, I would make this number one <laughs> in terms of living a, a, a life that's not boring. My life is not boring. I'm not bored. But many Christians are doing something they don't want to do. They're living a life they don't want to live. And I, I, I told you many years ago, the best example of risk, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but I want you to get the point. I've got bills. I've got a job. I've got a family. I need to make money. And so I was very well paid in social services. But you know what? I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do this anymore. I've done this long enough. I don't want to do it. I'm going. <laughs> I'm leaving. And everybody around me, oh, 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 you can't leave. Nobody gets out. Yeah. Nobody leaves. Stay here. No, I'm leaving. I'm going to take a risk. And I tell you what, guys. That was one of the best decisions I ever made. Not being willing to go with the crowd. Being willing to take a risk. Look at this here. Risk and security. If I offered you, you can only choose one. You can't have a little bit of both. (laughs) I'll have a little bit of risk and stuff. No, you can't. Jesus doesn't do that, right? Either you step out of the boat or you stay in the boat. Not a little bit of both. So if I ask you, Which one of these, you can only have one, which one of these will you choose? Don't answer. (laughs) Now, I like my security just like anybody else does. But God in my life, God intervened, as you know, and drastically removed all of my securities. He left me with nothing for a while. Because he wanted me to tell you. And so I had all my securities removed, ended up with nothing, And that was the best thing ever happened to me. Because I saw the deceitfulness of that thing. And what it was robbing me of. The life that I could have had. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I didn't say thank you at the time. (laughs) Oh, no. Thank you, Lord. You are the all-wise God. 
What I thought was my friend was robbing me of the one life I have. One life will soon be passed. And when he took away my security, I realized and I was forced into a life of risk. A life where I didn't quite know what was going to happen tomorrow. But then everything became alive to me. Things became, I recognized things for what they were. I I will never forget, for the first time in my life, walking through a very large shopping center. And that place had everything in it. Everything you can dream up or think of. And for the first time in my life, I walked through that place. And I didn't want anything. I want nothing. It's a great feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. Security had been relocated to heaven. So if you give me my choice, I can have risk or security. I will do away with security and I will take risk. And I will live a life, and I am, I will live a life of risk because I believe therein. That's what it was like when Jesus called them, wasn't it? And people want a risk-free life. There is no such thing. A single person says, well, I'm not going to get married because that's risky. (laughs) Being single is also risky. (laughs) It's all risky. I'm not going to change my job because I've got to... No, it's a risk to stay where you are. It's a risk to go. Right? I'm going to move to another nation. But maybe I shouldn't because it's a... Yes, it's a risk. But it's a risk for you to stay here. It's all risk. You just got to make a calculated biblical risk and learn to get into that mindset, which is what I've come to love, to be honest with you. Today, I love that mindset. I love that lifestyle because there's energy there. There's fire there. It's great. Don't sell yourself out. Don't sell yourself out for earthly security. How many scriptures have we got on that one? Endless scriptures. They seem so simple, don't they? Seem so simple. And yet those simple truths ruin many lives. Or at least they rob them of the excitement and the thrill of day-to-day following God. I I don't wish for things. Some people just wish their lives away. I wish this and I wish that. What are you wishing about? (laughs) You'll still be wishing in 20 years' time. Right? I repeat, I was in your position sitting in my office, wishing I could be full-time. It's enough of that. I'm out of here with a big risk. So don't be a wisher. Don't be a daydreamer. There's daydreamers everywhere. You meet them one year, ten years later, they're still talking about this. Talk, 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 talk. Yeah, same thing. One day, one day, God's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not doing your part. You're not acting in, in the way that you see the Bible guys do, right? Oh, yeah. Three weeks ago, immediately, they left their nets and followed. I was out running last week and I saw this man running ahead of me and he, he was very strange. His, his movements were strange. His, his, it was all off. And I didn't know why. I thought, that's not right at all. Something wrong here. And as I got closer to him, I realized he was blind. He was running through the park and he's blind, totally blind. What there was is there was a a guy in front of him with an elasticated string. And the string went back and tied on the blind man's arm. And he was running after the leader. I thought, you brave man. Huh? Isn't that brave? Imagine not just taking one cautious step. But imagine being so familiar with this. So trusting of this. That you're able to run and you're blind. Good example. Amen? Amen? And here we are. Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> yeah? Frightened even to take a, a, a tiny little step. And anyway, I, I, I'm, anyway, I'm not blind. I'm not blind because he holds, right? He holds my hand. And I need to get a, a good handle on that. A good awareness of his presence. I took a massive risk a few months ago. One of the biggest risks I've ever taken in my life, actually calculated risk but that's knowing him it paid off praise the Lord that's knowing him that's intimacy with God on the inside 
when you, you're walking and yes, you're taking risks and you see the outcome, you learn the outcome and it gives you more confidence. Not enough risk takers here, guys. Not enough, not enough, not enough. Point six, healthy people know how to ask for what they want. What's the point in going through your whole life and not getting what you want? <laughs> huh? Imagine that. Imagine not getting what you want. You've spent your whole life on earth and you never got what you wanted. That's not good. My wife was very good in this department, particularly sexually. Next weekend, Friday night and Saturday, we're meeting. So please, if you haven't registered as a couple, our theme for this night is going to be led by Steve Uppel. I think there's a book there. He, Steve and Esther are currently reading this book. It's one of my books, the second one on marriage. And there's a chapter in here which is called The Levels of Intimacy, taking you through this. Uh, for me, it's just it's critically important that you get what you want in life. Let me use sex as an example. In the bedroom, you need to get what you want. <laughs> They're all dead! <laughs> in the bedroom, you need to get what you want! Amen. God help us. We need some testosterone in here. <laughs> yeah. God help us all. So I got. I didn't get saved till later in life. I, I I was a man of the world very much so. So I came into my marriage thinking I was bringing some sexual experience. <laughs> yeah. So what I quickly realized is I wasn't. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't. And Jeanette was really the person who taught me what I want and how to get it. What are you laughing at? <laughs> she was very good at it. All I brought into our marriage was the sexual part. I was out there. You know how it is. But she wasn't. She was super spiritual and so much better than me. Good sex is like a good sermon. How long? What do you mean, yeah? We said, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Heaven's going, yeah, come on. <laughs> what I mean, what I mean by that, what I mean by that is this has got to penetrate. That's terrible. <laughs> this has got to penetrate. This has got to be something you take home with you. This has got to be something that I'm coming back next week for more. Do you follow the parallel? Yeah, okay. <laughs> You've got to want more. And if it's not leaving you in that place, something is missing. Something's wrong. And that's where I learned, that's where she taught me. I was coming just from one level of interaction in my relationship. And she was excellent at maturing me with this coalition, if you like, of attributes of a human being, of bringing me to that. You see, if I lose you, if I'm preaching here and you're sitting there, you know, from time to time, people are just lose interest. Like the bed. They just lose interest. Oh, how long is he going to go on for? <laughs> on and on and on and on and on. Get on with it. <laughs> just get on with it. I'm tired. You know? And I can see you. You see, I can see you. You're drifting away. What do I do when you do that? Look at me. Thank you. Look at me. There's a technique there. There's a technique. It's actually up here. And it's re-engaging the person. I'm engaging you. I'm making sure that you leave with something. Because I know you better than you know you in terms of this stuff. I know how to get that in there. And that requires me to grab you back. And that's really what Jeanette did for me. Look at me. Stay with me. And she made sex about her. Great job. Great job. She took away my distractions and she focused on herself. How do we get on to this anyway? <laughs> That's you, Richard. It's his fault. <laughs> I remember healthy people ask for, the, for what they want. Amen. <laughs> healthy people ask for what they want. I, I get myself in a lot of trouble now if I say this. <laughs> had this guy and he had this fetish with having his feet tickled. They're out there, I'm sorry. This guy liked to have his feet tickled. Thing. This, that was his thing. 
Uh, you're all listening now, aren't you? See, the top attention. Yeah, talk about tithing, they're all looking at the wall. This guy liked having a spectacle. So this became a little bit of a problem within that marriage. So I remember talking to him on his own one day, and I said to him, or to her on her own one day, and I said, you know what, darling? You need to start tickling those feet. <laughs> because, you see, if you don't, someone else will. And you need to, he is asking for what he wants. That's up to him, you know what I mean? So be a good wife. Accommodate him. Some people never get what they want. And if they don't get what they want within the marriage, they'll get it elsewhere. And you're creating a home that is a recipe for disaster. And I particularly hold the men accountable in this. You need to ask your wife, what does she want? That's a dangerous question. No? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Just skip that. Skip that. <laughs> New handbag, you everything else. Healthy people, let me repeat, healthy people ask for what they want. This is what I want. And actually, not just in the bedroom, but in life and in a relationship, you need to grow up to the place where you're able and strong enough and you have enough communion between yourselves as a couple to do that and to have that conversation. Amen. Amen. Number seven. Uh, healthy people know when it's time to move on in life and move on in relationships. True. I, I, uh, I am actually very, this is ministry, this is me in ministry. But when I'm not up here, I'm a completely different person. True? I'm very quiet and patient and kind, long-suffering, gentle, administrative, jovial, humble and meek. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm not like this at all. But I tell you what, the one thing that gets my goat, the one thing that will make me angry very quickly is if you start messing around with my self-worth. It's my hot spot. And that happened to me recently in a relationship that I've had for a long time. I still don't know why this particular individual tried to cut me down. You know what I mean? I thought, that's a snide remark. And you let it go. And then there's another snide remark. And I thought, you know what? This has been a great friendship for a long time. But right now, this relationship is not healthy for me. Because you're trying to put me down. I can feel it. So I had a little conversation with that individual privately. I said, you know what? You're a long-term friend. But something's not right in the way you're speaking to me. And I'm giving you one warning. You better change your attitude or we're done. Because right now you're toxic to me and I'm not going to let you in my life. And a few hours went by, the person came back to me and said, can I apologize because I think I've been wrong towards you? And I said, no, I don't accept apologies. I never have. I don't like apologies. They're just a joke. Show me in the Bible where you apologize for sin. You know. No, you repent of sin. So I don't need you to say sorry. I don't need, what I need is a change of behavior. Yes, so the next time we meet, I need to sense that respect. And if that respect is not there, I'm done with you. Amen? Amen. You, I demand respect. I demand respect as a human being. You will not undercut me. And that is, thank God, my hotspot. And I don't want to change it. Because it will demean me. I'm a child of a king, right? Yes. Hello? My father has forgiven me. God accepts me. So who are you? Who are you? And some people will try and bug you. Some people will try and cut you down. As I said at the beginning, there are some people on this earth and their sole purpose. They wake up in the morning. How can I get you today? <laughs> right? <laughs> their purpose is to try and pull you down. Normally, they're miserable people. And they see you advancing, they see you progressing, and human nature tries to pull down because, sorry, but it's a fact, it makes them feel better for a moment. And you need to rise above all of that. Amen. Healthy people, how do they live? Point eight. Healthy people don't go on procrastinating and procrastinating. I think it's okay to put something off, you know, once or twice, but you don't make it a lifestyle and you take responsibility for your own life. 
And, you know, in conclusion this morning, folks, that is really a punchline for you to take home. Would you take responsibility for your own life? Please. You know who got you into the situation you're in today? You. You made the decisions. You made the choices. And you are the person who's responsible for getting you into the place and the position that you're in today. Now, who is going to get you out? You. You and you alone, actually, because of free will. You and you alone have the ability and the strength within yourself to move on. And to change those circumstances. Healthy people don't put that choice off. They realize they have one life. One life. One shot. And I'm taking it. Oh yeah. One life. One. I was in central London last night. And they, uh, Samsung have a new phone coming out. And the, all the movie guys were there with all the lights and cameras and everything else. It was like Hollywood. It was the director who was going, action, cut, and all that sort of stuff. And they took take after, take one, take two, take three. And, you know, the thought just crossed my mind. Life's not like that. You don't get another shot. There's no resets. This is not a dress rehearsal here this morning. This is the real deal. This is it. This is it. This moment, this day, will not return. It's gone through your fingers. And you know what, what's wrong with many believers is other people, they believe that other people are controlling them. And when I have one-to-one -one counsel, people will say to me, but you don't understand. I can't because of, what is that? Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. I would do it, but I can't because of, what is your blank? What is the thing that... <coughs> Is, is, is holding you back. I can't because of my boss. Tell your boss to get stuck. No. no. <laughs> I can't because it's going to cause a mess. God doesn't care about a mess. Right? He can handle your mess. No problem. Read the Bible. There's messes everywhere. A big mess. Don't be afraid of a mess. I can't because of what people will say. Stuff that. Who cares what people will say? You obey people. That's what most Christians are obeying people. Their whole lives never getting what they want. Never getting what they're called to be or to do. Because you're obeying people. You're frightened of what people will say. You're a Christian. You're born again. You've got a spirit. Amen? Amen. Many Christians, you wouldn't believe it. Their thoughts are all in their mind. Mental, mental, mental. And not living in the spirit. You know, they say there's three types of people. Those who make things happen. Those who watch things happen. And those who haven't got a clue what happened. <laughs> They're looking, what, what just happened? Bystanders. And you need to believe in yourself that I am one who's going to make things happen. I'm going to act on that inner call. Act on my belief. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the whole earth to strengthen those who are fully committed to him. You have got more power and autonomy than you realize. And God is just looking for the people who will respond in that, who will step out and act. Remember, it's all about action, right? No more talk, 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 talk. No. Stop it. Stop it. Stop wishing. You'll wish your life away. You'll wish your life away. That's daydreaming. Action. Action. Jesus. God help you, folks. God help you. God help you. Father God. Lord, we lift ourselves to you. I thank you for this church thank you for the fellowship we share for the love we share with one another and god we look to the future and i pray you would enable us to embrace risk the risky walk of following christ hand in hand like that blind man running knowing that he trusts the person who leads i trust the one ahead of me i trust that he's my forerunner and he will not misguide me 
Would you just lift your right hand? And God, just like that blind man, took a hold of that rope and had the faith and the boldness and the willingness to, to run in what was darkness. I pray for every hand raised here that you will place here your God, your hand. And we take hold of you in the spirit. And as we leave this place, come with us, Lord. We shake off the bondage of securities in this world. You warned us and forgive us for not doing so. We shake.